So what can be done to stop Phytophthora from invading all these wildlands? Are there things we can do? That's the topic of this third section of our presentation. So how do we prevent Phytophthora interjections? Well, the most obvious thing probably is to not bring in Phytophthora infested material. This seems pretty logical, but it isn't done as often as you think it ought to be done. Here we are in a site in Joseph Grant County Park. This site is shown up in the, the dot way up here in the corner. It has these nice native oak stands where we've sampled and no Phytophthora was found. It also has these nearby plantings of nursery stock where we sampled and find Phytophthora cambivora. So an introduction of the pathogen at the upper part of this watershed has the potential to spread this pathogen throughout the watershed further down in affecting many oak populations down below that. Here's a site where there was a declining oak. We recovered Phytophthora cambivora and Clematispora from near the root zone of this thing. It wasn't obvious immediately where that contamination had come from, but in looking back at some aerial photos earlier in the site development, we see that there actually had been a holding nursery of sorts placed in the root zone of this tree. So all these Phytophthora infested nursery stock were being watered and that, that drainage included inoculum that inoculated this tree and it declined to the point that it had to be removed shortly thereafter. So one thing we know is that it's a lot easier to prevent Phytophthora from being introduced in the first place than it is to try to eradicate it. It's cheaper and it's more effective. Eradication is very difficult to do and often not really possible. And if you don't eradicate, you have perpetual management. You always have Phytophthora to deal with. Here's a planting that was done direct seeded. And we see that uh, there's no risk associated with direct seeding, certainly compared to planting with nursery stock and these plants are doing quite well. Here's another example of direct seeded valley oaks planted from acorns along the site. Uh, they're 14 years old, they're doing quite well. And again, no risk associated with, with nursery stock. So this is the type of thing we want to do when it's possible to minimize our restoration techniques by using either natural regeneration, direct seeding, or on-site propagation with clean materials such as cuttings where, for things like willows and cottonwoods. The issue is that in restoration, we're trying to improve a uh, site. And if we're introducing exotic pathogens, we're not improving, we're degrading the site. So it's really not compatible with restoration. And with contaminated nursery stock being one of the most effective and direct ways to actually introduce pathogens to a site, we just need to stop doing it. We just It's an easy thing to do if you consider the alternatives and use them to the degree possible. So one of the alternatives is just to avoid any type of conventional nursery stock because we know that this is going to be contaminated. And besides restoration planting itself, we also don't want to use this type of contaminated stock in areas where we can contaminate adjacent wildlands or in reserves at gateways, uh, upslope of habitat. Those are all areas to avoid the use of this type of stock. If we want to produce clean stock, this takes a quite a, a different approach than what we see in most conventional nurseries. These types of procedures have been worked out. Um, there are best management practices for, for producing Phytophthora free stock that were produced by California Native Plant Society and then modified slightly and adopted by the Phytophthora Working Group. This is a working group consisting of a, a variety of different agencies, nurseries, um, and scientists that are working together to, to try to come up with standards to minimize the, the risks posed by these pathogens. One thing that's come out of this, this uh, project is that uh, a pilot accreditation project called AIR has been uh, established and now into its second year here in 2020, where nurseries are essentially evaluated and uh, tested to see whether they are really complying with BMPs and whether there is indeed no detectable Phytophthora in their stock. Um, the best management practices, they're available up on our website and in various other places. But they all boil down to starting with clean materials, clean inputs, and then keeping those materials clean throughout the production practice.
It's not the standard practice of, of commercial nurseries, or it hasn't been, but it can be done. It's more labor intensive, more costly, but the alternative is to be producing infected material. In many cases, that's really not a good alternative. In fact, I would argue in no case is it a good alternative. Um, and although these seem like new concepts, really, we can go back to Ken Baker's book from 1957, and see most of the principles that we're talking about following here were identified back, back many, many decades ago. Testing is an important part of a clean production system, testing both during stock production and pre-delivery to confirm that Phytophthora is not detectable. We developed this leachate baiting test, which is shown here, which involves irrigating the plants multiple times with a known fixed amount of irrigation based off the container size, and then collecting the resultant leachate into a specialized vessel to concentrate the billet spores. Pair. Once that test is over, the pair is, is collected, placed with some of the leachate water into a bag, and then incubated to see whether Phytophthora is present. In the case of this one, you can see lesions on this pair. There are other things besides nursery stock that can contain Phytophthora propules. Fill soils, mulch amendments, for particular organic amendments, could be contaminated. This particular site that was soil being excavated, considered for use elsewhere, it was a site with some history of risk because there had been a nursery here about 50 years prior. But even though this nursery had been long gone, Phytophthora was still associated with roots of the existing plants at this site. If we want to test soil, it's really much more efficient to test it in place because you can look for the roots of existing plants there. Once we stockpile soil, we've mixed it around. The distribution of Phytophthora uh, typically is shallow in the soil, so once you mix soil, topsoil and subsoil, you make it more difficult to find those propules. It also takes a high number of tests, often on a large volume of soil, to actually be efficient for detection, and typically that becomes prohibitive after a while. We don't want to bring in Phytophthora, but we also don't want to move it around in the site. So there, we have a site that could be infested. We want to consider avoiding moving that material. Here's an example that may be a little unexpected, but here's a typical trail maintenance situation. A tree failed to cross the trail, uh, had to be removed, cut up the trail, regraded a certain amount. Farther down the trail, we see that uh, the crew decided to use some of this excess soil to make a little water bar. Ordinarily, I think that was a reasonable thing to do, but as it turns out, the roots from this bay contained Phytophthora cactorum. We were able to bait it right out of this water bar. So in this case, that little maintenance activity ended up moving contamination many meters down the trail, uh, which would have taken years to spread on its own. So besides having some concept of where you might have contamination, we also want to try to minimize activities when we're more likely to pick up contamination and move it, and that's wet conditions in particular. We happened to be here right after it rained and we had to move down the trail a little bit. It was pretty heavily mucked up by cattle activity. And we picked up this mud on our shoes. We stopped at a point to clear it off. We decided to bait that, and it turned out that we could bait Phytophthora crassimura off of that those, that mud collected from these food soils. Construction is a large scale movement of soil. So in these sort of situations, understanding where Phytophthora might be located and managing the, both the timing and how you phase your movement of soils to minimize contamination, that's, that's a very important thing. Other things, other processes can also move soil particularly when the soil is wet, uh, grazing animals like cattle can pick up a lot of mud and move it from place to place. When we have a situation where we have a known infested area, which this uh, bay with the Phytophthora near Europea is located just a, just a short distance from this hill, which is considered to be sensitive habitat, you'd have to manage your grazing to make sure that you weren't running cattle between this infested area and up to this habitat in a way that they could transport contaminated soil.
identifying and delineating infested areas helps to inform management in this respect because once we know what areas are infested we can we or have a good concept of those we can try to avoid movement so in this particular situation here we want to avoid making connections between this phytophthora infested slope on this side of the spillway and this this native habitat of endangered species on the opposite side typically that would not be an issue but if you're doing something like construction that it requires rebuilding the spillway now we've got an issue and we have to think about it very carefully how one goes about doing that to minimize the risk to this this habitat so a question that comes to mind is how common phytophthora infestations are where do, are we at risk of encountering them where would we look for them and how do we determine whether an area might be infested with phytophthora species so to set some sort of baseline we were involved in this study with the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency and sampled areas in the Habitat Conservation Plan Reserve System. All these X's are our sample locations, and the red X's show where we actually detected Phytophthora. We had 181 samples, of which 29% were positive overall. 20% if we only look at the upland samples, because some samples were from water and wetland areas but even in upland areas we still were picking up reasonable amounts of phytophthora we also identified a total of 20 different phytophthora taxa which is a reasonable amount of diversity considering the what we are looking at one thing we notice is that most of the uh, phytophthoras are found in areas that tend to be at least periodically quite wet or subject to to, to wetting to wet conditions um, we still do detect phytophthora under dry conditions, but there are fewer taxa found in those locations. And you'll also see that there's overlap between between these, and some species were picked up much more frequently than other species. Here's a location that we sampled, and our first sample taken here was in an area where we found uh, phytophthora near Europea, and it was associated with these declining bay trees. So we decided afterwards we'd go back and resample to see whether up these drainages we could determine where the source of this was. So we sampled in these locations here. We detected Phytophthora, but of course they ended up being a variety of other Phytophthoras, not the one that we were found down below. So it does look like this site has had contamination from a number of different sources, and the diversity sort of suggests nursery origin sources and we do have at least a couple of possibilities both the older orchard area here with orchard trees are normally planted for nursery stock and the landscaping around this much more recent development here's another example of a site where we sampled where oaks were our primary species of concern at this site which is up a hill and seemed relatively undisturbed in some respects we picked up phytophthora cambivora associated with these blue oak trees that were declining. Now it wasn't totally undisturbed. There was a fence line not far away and there's some ranch roads not too far away. So we were curious as to what other sources of contamination might be in the local area. And we sampled further over in this other area. We did pick up Phytophthora cambivora associated with an old orchard. So that was a much more logical situation. We also did some sampling in some areas that are considered to be high risk things along trails and other developed areas at this particular site where you can see it's kind of a trail road junction there's been material deposited here phytophthora close to ohioensis was isolated from these valley oak trees and in this site down here we detected phytophthora taxon agrifolia and crassimura associated with these these valley oak trees which were in an area which is apparently old agricultural field there's a drainage ditch through it there was also some evidence of old structures around here so here's something with some disturbance history and potentially a source of contamination associated with that what is a little alarming on all these oak woodland finds is that we do have at least 29 phytophthora taxa that we have found associated with california native oaks Many of these are known only from, from plants of nursery origin, but a number of these are also been found in native habitats. So 
the possibility that many of these other ones found as nursery stock can work their way into to native habitats is a cause of concern. So if we do want to protect our amazing oak resources and other native plant resources in California, we really do need to consider how we, we can manage these lands, in particular how to avoid bringing Phytophthora into these areas, as well as other invasives. At the end of this presentation, once again, I want to put up this list of the agencies that provide funding for this research, as well as our cooperating labs at UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and of course, the assistance from the California Department of Food and Ag Plant Diagnostic Lab.